tonight we are. We are in Georgia, eight, eight or nine cities in Georgia. Let's take a look. Uh, we are in Athens, Atlanta, Marietta, Duluth. We are in Peach Street City. We are in Latonia, Jefferson. We are in Gainesville. We are in Water Robins. And of course, uh, 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 besides that, in all the states, uh, we are in about 16 states looking to us right now. Uh, as far as the country goes, I read, uh, I added up there, and we are in about, uh, out of 104 countries, we are in at least 40-some uh, countries, especially in, especially in uh, Uzbekistan, Venezuela, Vietnam, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Australia, Bahamas, and uh, several other countries. There are 101 countries tuned to this website, lightofrain.com. And so, we might be in short numbers here, but uh, the numbers on the internet count thousands and thousands upon thousands, people that are listening. So, I have a word to you that if you are from a country that speaks English, I want to welcome you to come and to be a part of this conference. And uh, also, I want to welcome those of you that are from Brazil. There's a lot of people from Brazil tuned tonight to listen to the message. Amen? Amen. Good evening. There wasn't enough pressure before that. And now we know we're in all these countries with all these thousands of people looking on. I've prayed all day that uh, my message tonight would be uh, pleasing to God. I know my wife has been praying all day long for me. Uh, I want to share my message because you've heard of the purpose-driven life. My life is the event-driven life. So I'm going to talk to you about some of those events. I was born and raised Catholic, so I've got the corner on guilt and fear, right? Uh, didn't know anything about a personal relationship with Jesus. Never talked about it as, as children. The only time I saw it was after Saturday Night Live, Tom Landry would come on for a 30-second spot about having a personal relationship with Jesus. I don't know if you remember those commercials or not. Uh, so I kind of moved along through college, kind of steady Eddie, uh, and then when I was about 26, 27 years old, I met a fellow named Angelo Lucchese, an older fellow in the end zone of a Memphis State game because my brother was a football coach. And he asked me uh, as I was leaving after I met him, he said, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, well, I don't know. He says, I'll pick you up at 9 o'clock for church. And we went to church together almost every week for about four and a half years from that point on. And the one thing that he did for me, he told me to pack a bag for the weekend, and I thought maybe we were gonna go down to see some show at the casinos or go see some famous celebrity because he ran in those circles. He dropped me off at this old church in downtown Memphis, and he said, just go through that door, I'll pick you up on Sunday. This was Thursday. <laughs> and I didn't understand. He said, you will right through those doors. And so back then they called it Casillo, the, the Catholic version of Walk to Emmaus. And that was an event that led to the change in my life. The next big event was when I was 30 years old, I got married to my wife, Pam, who is the rock, the spiritual rock of our family. She's always a mile ahead of me in her walk, and I can't tell you how much that means to me. Over the years, I prayed. I prayed for things. I prayed for help. Occasionally, I prayed to get out of trouble. <laughs> when we found out that we were going to have a tough time having children, I really prayed. I prayed very, very hard. Uh, that was one thing that we talked about that we really wanted. And uh, we got in touch with this minister who was pro-choice. Uh, however, the two choices were keep the baby or put the baby up for adoption. So we went through the whole process, very, very difficult process. We handed over all of our work, we did the interviews, and he said, don't call me, I'll call you. It could be a couple of years. About 30 days later, at seven o'clock at night, we get a phone call, and he says, I have somebody that wants to talk to you. It was a 16-year-old girl from Rensselaer, <laughs> Indiana, who said that she was gonna keep her baby, except she would adopt, let us adopt the baby, that would be her choice. So, 
We were very excited, very excited. I came back from a business trip about a month, month and a half later to find out that my wife was pregnant. <laughs> so that was a tough one. We, we prayed through that, but at the end of the day, uh, two for the price of ten. <laughs> so we had two babies, just seven months apart. Career, family, I was very active in our church. Busy, always busy, always on the move. Not, didn't have time for anything that wasn't scheduled uh, or to be scheduled. And then I went on my first mission trip at age 50. If you are younger than 50, do not wait until you're 50 to go on your first mission trip. Um, I went to Kenya. I went twice. The first time was as a participant. We did a medical center project there. The second time as a board member, bringing uh, communities together uh, to, to serve the, the least and the lost uh, and provide resources uh, to them. On the first trip, Second, Second night, night, about 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, the leader, the leader of our group said, okay, there's 12 of us, we're each going to go to a church tomorrow, and you, and you have, have to be prepared, prepared to tell them your Bible verse, and, and to uh, uh, no, preach, no, preach for five, five or ten minutes. minutes. I, I was absolutely, absolutely floored. I said, oh, oh no, I, I, that, can't that can't be, because, because I don't know any Bible verses, verses. I haven't memorized anything. Catholics, Catholics don't actually, don't actually read, the read the Bible. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, we read catechisms and we get taught other lessons. So I flipped open the Bible, put my finger down, and right on top of Psalms 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Amen. Bang! And I can remember that. Not only can I remember it, but it was placed on my heart and my mind that night. It's short, it's simple, but think about it. I was never still. I was always busy, always on to the next thing. And now I was sitting in the middle of Africa with a Bible verse. Day, and I was just overcome by the quiet and the stillness. There wasn't any cell service. There wasn't any television. There wasn't any radio. There was nothing in that room that night except for me and my God. And that was unbelievable change in my life. What I saw in Africa was poverty, humility, faith, and joy in Jesus. I've never seen uh, people that were has so much joy for Jesus, and I wanted some of that. Uh, I met a little girl on my third day there. She was four or five years old at an orphanage, and uh, she came over and grabbed my hand, and she said, do you want to see where I sleep? And I said, well, sure. So on our way there, she turned to me, and she said, and what's your Bible verse? <laughs> Be still and know that I am God. She said, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> now, it's been 26 years, and we communicate almost every month via email. She's 26 years old now. I'm very proud of her. She just graduated uh, from college. She's 21 years old. From that trip, I started Backpack Blessings, which is uh, we pack backpacks full of food every Thursday night. We deliver them to the children at the school. We pray at the school, we pray with the children and for the children, and it's a public school. And they've never said a word one about that. So we are the most consistent Christian message that they see week in and week out. We serve about 600 children about 32 weeks a year. So life goes on, I'm now 62 years old, and I get called to go to India. It was more of a medical, and we were training young pastors. We had about 100 young pastors, some of whom walked two or three days to get to this and slept outside under the trees to attend these sessions every day. Uh, I taught six Being with me and guiding me. What did I see there, though? I saw poverty at the highest level. 
I saw sadness. I saw people that didn't have much hope. I saw despair. I saw risk, risk and, and safety issues. But they had faith. They had commitment. And they made the great sacrifice because they were putting their lives in danger. I was telling um, a gentleman earlier that I met a young pastor who was telling me about a young girl who came and wanted to be baptized. And he said, I'll baptize you. And she said, no, I'm going to go home and tell my family I would like them to be there. He said, great, we'll do it tomorrow. She went home and her father threw her out of the 10th floor window of their apartment because she was trying to convert to Christianity. Persecution is a very, very sad thing uh, to see. Each trip that I made changed the trajectory of my walk, of my faith. And they were all specific events that I know God had planned for me, but I certainly didn't know. And then at the age of 66, I run into this guy. Where's Rick? And I go to Brazil. Very different, very, very different. It had some elements of some of the other trips, but this was next level stuff. I have to tell you, it was deep, it was intense, it got inside me, inside my soul. Introspection was just unbelievable. I was so uncomfortable every day because the people that were in the room with me were all up here and I was down here. And, um, and, and, and the worship, the, the worship band is fantastic, by the way. You guys are great. The worship in Brazil is off the charts. Uh, it is so exciting. Um, I felt it. It was beautiful. Um, there was a miracle, too, that happened. The, the last couple nights we were at a church in, uh, I think, Rick's hometown. And they had planned this big revival for two nights. But some other opposing force put a concert stage right outside the church in the park and was planning on playing music so loud that we would not hear anything in the church that we were at. We started at, I don't know, 7 o'clock. At 6.50 each night, the rain came down so hard you couldn't even see your hand. And they all dispersed. And we had the best two nights of worship that I've ever had in my life. So now comes in the Holy Spirit, which is a kind of a, a, a newer concept to me also. Uh, and the Holy Spirit replaced all of my fear with faith. Each experience was a catalyst that moved me to the next level. I want that. I saw it in other people and I just want it to be like that. I want it to have that feeling. Um, somebody asked me uh, or somebody asked Rick earlier have they been touched by Rick? And my response is, no. I got hit with a two-by-four by Rick <laughs> almost every day. When I walked up 152 steps from my room to the main room where we met every day, uh, he was there with something so profound and so life-changing uh, that I'll just, uh, I'll just never forget it. You know, uh, I've got a long way to go but I'm closer than I ever was in my life. Um, I recently heard a story about uh, the guy goes to heaven, walking down the hallway with St. Peter, and he looks in the doorway and he sees thousands and thousands of angels. He said, what's that? He said, well, that's where they're processing uh, prayer requests. Get millions of prayer requests every day. And they walk further down the hall and he looks into the next door and there's one guy sitting there. And he says, well, what's in that room? He said, those are the people that thank us for answering those prayers. So every night before I go to bed now, I thank God. I tell God how much I trust him, how much I love him, how sorry I am that I'm a sinner. But I'm going to hit it hard every single day. And I thank God for this ministry. And I thank God for events like this because I am out of my comfort zone, but I feel a lot better now because I'm done. Thank you very much.